Kirk. Okay, Kirk, please. Okay. Copy. Okay, that's Atlanta clear of the vessel. Copy. Raps are zeroed. Obviously, the 6 8 raps are zeroed. Do you know where to zero those ones if they were not? Um. Atlanta page. Okay. Near the bottom right, uh, middle right, I should say. 0 6 8. So they are already are, obviously, but in the future, if they weren't, they'll be there. Okay. Yeah, thanks for your help. Okay, I'm going to turn on our sonars. Uh, ROV, are you happy to hold position here with the ship? Uh, yeah. Right. Where? Uh, I think they're cleaning outside. Why aren't we getting... Yeah, that's probably it. We're 
getting a trail, but not pecans. Okay, I'll deal with that. Let me call the bridge. Uh, bridge, now we are good to hold position here. Now bridge, copy that, hold position. Oh, actually, uh, we're not at 50 yet, are we? No. Uh, bridge, nav, uh, disregard. Can we continue at uh, 0 0.2, please? Head again, 0 0.3 on this heading. 0 0.3, affirmative. Can we refresh this? We're not getting... Uh... Oh, there's a refresh button. It's not refreshing. Yeah, we usually... Control van, that's us all stop, 5-0. Copy that, uh, taking control from here. Alright. Okay, so... Uh, bridge nav, we're good to stop here, in all position, thanks. Okay, bridge, uh, oh, sorry, uh, control van, bridge, yep, copy that, hold position. Okay. And you're, you're going down yep. as well? Okay. Okay. Uh, control van bridge, we're holding now, and the uh, bridge is going, going off radio comms. Copy that. Transferring over to uh, intercom. Thanks. This is an audio slate for dive number H1992, so 0272 Okay. 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 This is an audio slate for dive hotel 1992022748 oh oh mark okay i was going to wait to do like the first entry in the log for the things until we got to bottom yeah um as far as a log entry goes yeah that makes perfect sense okay. but i would just do like a quick
Is someone calling me? Oh, go for it, yeah. Thanks for going for it. All right, everybody. Hello. Good afternoon. At least it's afternoon here in uh, the Johnston Atoll region, where we are going to be exploring for the next several hours. This is Brittany, um, a science communication fellow here on the EV Nautilus. And in just a moment, I'm going to go around and ask the rest of the crew here in the uh, in the control room to introduce themselves as well. But just a little bit about this dive. Um, again, we are exploring um, an unnamed uh, Southwest Boundary Seamount. This is our third dive of NA-153, exploring Johnston Atoll. So our expected maximum depth for this dive is going to be 9,514 feet or 2,900 meters. And we are expecting to be down in the depths for about 24 hours. So I have opened up the chat if any of you would like to ask questions or make comments while we are making our way down, please feel free to do so. That's going to make this uh, probably two hour journey a lot faster if, we, if you all talk to us. That'd be a lot of fun. So anyway, um, again, like I said, I'm not here in this room all by myself. I have some really awesome people joining me. So as we make our way down to the deep sea, you will get to know us a little bit better. This is actually our very first like real blue water session we've had. So the first time uh, this crew, the four to eight crew came on, we were only maybe in here for 30 minutes before the <laughs> Or the next crew had to come and take us over, so uh, you're going to hear us talking a lot more than usual. Yay. All right, Nick, tell us about yourself. <laughs> All right. Hey, Brittany. How you doing? Hi, Nick. <laughs> My name is uh, Nick Foresta. I am a geologist. Uh, I work at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, at the uh, geoscience department over there. Uh, we work on dating seamounts, uh, making age determinations, and reconstructing hotspot tracks uh, to kind of better understand uh, crust, crust uh, evolution and uh, uh, plate tectonic uh, migration. So it's a fun thing that we get to do, and uh, it's kind of like playing detective with the Earth. Cool. And you said that you're from Las Vegas? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Las Vegas in the middle of the desert, and uh, found myself out here in the middle of the ocean, so I'm very excited. Yeesh. Las Vegas is too hot for me. I can't, I can't do it. Gets a little warm. It's, <laughs> you could say that. All right, thanks so much, sure. Nick. All right, going down the line, Steve, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do here on the Nautilus? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Oskovich. I'm the watch lead for the 4 to 8 watch. I'm also the biology science lead for this particular expedition, NA 153, exploration of Johnston Atoll, deep sea biodiversity, and uh, and seamount geology. Uh, normally, uh, I am a uh, researcher, postdoctoral researcher at Boston University when I'm not on the ship, uh, where I conduct research into the ecology, but also the biodiversity of deep sea coral eco deep, sea, deep sea corals and the ecosystems they support. Uh, my research lately has been focused on uh, trying to resolve some of the more complex relationships about um, biodiversity of species and, and delimitation of species in this particularly diverse area of the Central Pacific, as well as using environmental DNA tools and reference libraries to better explore the deep ocean. Um, so my job for the watch is making sure that we um, stick to our dive plan uh, to the best of our ability, helping to uh, liaise between our scientists ashore community who are on our chat room uh, ashore, providing us input about specialties we may not have the ability uh, to have out on the ship, and making sure that we uh, make document and uh, record and collect the things that we need to collect and leave the things that we don't need. Sounds like a lot. Just a <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Yeah, you do yeah. a lot. Thank you. 
All right, and then next up we have Bronwyn. Bronwyn, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing here on the Nautilus? Yeah, so my name's Bronwyn. I'm from Kauai, Hawaii, so this is right in my home turf. I am the ocean science intern aboard the Nautilus for this expedition. Um, in the control van, I am the data logger, so I'm making sure that everything that goes on, everything that we see, is written down so we can remember that later and when we are taking our samples um, making sure I'm writing down all the information uh, that has to go along with that and I it's my first time on the Nautilus I'm very excited to be here when I'm back at home I am interning with the State Department of Land and Natural Resources and I'm working with the seabird and nene biologists there and um, yeah, super stoked to be out on the Nautilus on this expedition. Thanks, Bronwyn. Yeah, I, I feel like I pester Bronwyn all the time asking about birds. What kind of bird is that we're seeing? <laughs> and I'm learning a lot, so. All right, we are getting a couple of questions in the chat. Um, somebody was asking, when is the last time you discovered a whale fall? That's a great question. So yeah, um, on occasion, when we are doing these deep sea dives, we do discover whale falls. So for anybody listening who doesn't quite know what that is, it's when a whale passes away at sea, its uh, body eventually sinks down um, to the seafloor and it provides a tremendous amount of food for all of the uh, all of the fauna that live down in the depths so I this is my very very first time on the Nautilus and this is my third dive I have never seen a whale fall but I have a feeling I'm in a in a room with people who have inside so I don't know when the last one that the Nautilus has found was, but I do know that they've seen whale falls several times. Yeah, I can't speak for chronology because I have no sense of time anymore, but um, <laughs> we've seen a couple of whale falls uh, in the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Um, we've seen a couple on the Southern California coast. Um, out here in the last few months, we've actually found a number of beaked whale bones that are fossilized um, out at the Kingman Reef and Palmyra Atoll region and then out here in Johnson Atoll just a couple days ago we picked up a couple more of those beak whale bones um, but as of yet it's still just a couple of bones we haven't found a whole whale fall um, fossils yes yeah, yeah. Um, but Steve the question was uh, the last whale fall we found and I I think it might have been in Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary right yeah it hasn't I think so along the west coast yeah yeah, we visited twice, right? Correct, yeah. And then there's a couple on the Southern California coast that we've seen as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So, Samantha, that was your voice speaking, and I don't know if you've introduced yourself yet, so perfect timing. That was my voice speaking. Yes. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Samantha Wishnack, navigator um, on this cruise. I'm also the operations coordinator for the Ocean Exploration Trust, which is the nonprofit that owns and operates Nautilus. Uh, was there a other things that we were sharing about ourselves? Or not yet? Great. I'm, I'll I'm hold. I'll hold <laughs> my voice. <laughs> I'm pacing myself. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah, we have a little bit of blue water on this. A watch. little bit. Just a bit. <laughs> Yeah, about how long do we think it might take to get to the bottom or to our target depth? It's like an hour and a half. Right. About 92 minutes and 42 seconds. <laughs> yeah, now that we're counting. <laughs> to be exact. I think that was your intro, Gabby. Oh, that was okay. your voice. Yeah, yeah, that was my voice. This is my voice speaking. <laughs> uh, I'm Gabby Inglis, and I'm one of the pilots on this watch. That's nice to meet you, Gabby. <laughs> thanks, my name thanks, is Karen. <laughs> now over to Karen. <laughs> uh, my name is Karen Martinez. I'm an ROV pilot um, visiting from the Monterey Bay Area Research Institute. And Mbari is, I would say, a friendly rival of Nautilus and OET. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> I love that. <laughs> 
Is that my cue? That's, yeah, yeah, that's cute. <laughs> Is that your voice? This is my voice speaking. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm Logan Ossenjuk. Uh, I am the video engineering intern on this watch, and I guess I'm visiting from NOAA Fisheries, NIMS, um, in Portland, Oregon, technically. And UC Santa Barbara. I call both. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And that is the four to eight crew. So you're gonna be hearing, <laughs> like I said earlier, you're gonna be hearing us talk a little bit more as we are experiencing blue water. So we call this portion of the dive when we're going down and when we're coming up, um, we call this blue water because obviously we're just seeing a lot of blue. Uh, but you may also notice that we're seeing a lot of little white specks, some floaties here and there. Um, so we call this marine snow, and essentially it's little bits and pieces of uh, debris um, that fall from the surface. So it can be anything that sloughs off, sloughs off naturally from uh, living organisms like fish scales, uh, dead skin scales, excuse me, dead skin cells, things like that. And eventually, um, it takes them a really, really, really long time, but eventually all of these tiny particles make a, make their way down to the ocean floor. So even when we're diving at 2,900 meters, we will still be seeing this marine snow. So if anybody is wondering what the current depth is for Hercules, it is 440 meters and counting. And we do have two ROVs that we're using. So we have Hercules as well as Atalanta. So again, this is the third dive of NA-153, and we are going to be exploring an unnamed southwest boundary seamount around the Johnston Atoll region. Is this seamount subaerial? <laughs> Oh boy. Oh, no. <laughs> Starting early. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I hope not, because we drove right over the top of it. Yeah. A ago. You might be in trouble if uh -huh. it is. We would be subaerial. Yeah. I'm sorry, what word? We are subaerial. <laughs> I was busy. I missed, I missed my favorite word. You did. I have a feeling it's going to come back. Actually, I think they call that an involuntary dry docking. Involuntary when what? Involuntary dry docking. Dry docking. <laughs> yeah. Oh, when you find a seamount without a mapping oh. system? When, when you run over something so Yeah, I see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the original mapping system. <laughs> very, very high resolution. <laughs> very high risk. <laughs> Thank you. 
All Sorry, right. Gabby. It's not meant to be. Yeah, so uh, we have been out at sea for, oh my gosh, how many days has it been? What day is it? We left on the second, <laughs> right? The second, the second, no, third. Okay. Third or second. Something like that. Um, yeah, so we had to make a decision to get in a safe zone because there was Hurricane Dora that was right here exactly where we're exploring now. Um, so you may have noticed that we were a bit farther south than we had planned for for a few days, but we are back here in the region that we had originally uh, uh, been planning to dive at. So we're back, we're doing our dives, everything's great. So if you notice that we did have kind of a zigzag path that we were taking, um, yeah, it was, we were just trying to stay safe. But, and also while we were doing that, we were, um, we were mapping too, so getting some better ideas of what the seafloor might look like around this region. So um, leading into that, there is a question, how do exploration sites get chosen? So if I'm not mistaken, we always dive or we try to dive at places where we have at least mapped first. And so we use a, we use a type of sonar to kind of get an idea of what the seafloor looks like, and then we choose uh, the dives based on maybe what we think would be a fruitful dive. But you all can correct me if I'm wrong on that. Yeah, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, we have the fortune of having a lot of map data from uh, an expedition that Nautilus did last year. Ooh, jelly. Oh, very nice, Tina for. Or, I don't know what cool. that was that. Um, it might have also been a appendicular end, but I couldn't tell. I'll have to go yeah, back to the video. Very quick. Um, yeah, we have really good mapping data of this area already. This seamount was mapped last year on uh, NA140, 140, which is a mapping cruise that Nautilus did dedicated mapping crews to lay the groundwork for our exploration for on NA-141 last year, and this cruise. So somebody online is wondering, what are each of your favorite sea animals? Excellent question, I'll start. So I'm sure everybody in this room already knows I'm obsessed with whales. Um, so my absolute favorite animal on earth, I love, love, love whales, um, specifically killer whales, orcas. My absolute favorite ever since I was probably five. <laughs> um, so that's mine. And I guess we can just go down the line like we did before. Nick, what's your favorite animal? Uh, I'd probably go with uh, stone crab, maybe a rockfish. <laughs> oh, <One> no. <laughs> oh, I can, knew can you, it was can coming. You, can you put on the smug cam? Smug cam. Yep, <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, it's smug time. Smug science cam. You earned <laughs> smug cam. Smug science cam. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, no, that's, that's smug everyone cam. There you smug go. <laughs> smug science Look at that face. <laughs> no, there are <laughs> smug this time. Yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, the question was, what's your favorite animal? And his answer was? Rockfish. What was his answer? We can see it live now. <laughs> what, was your, what was Nick's answer? A uh, stone crab, or maybe a uh, rock shrimp, or... Rockfish. You know, rockfish, rock rock yeah. yeah. Rockfish. Uh, so there's a stone fish. Stone there fish, yeah. Stone yeah. fish, stone fish is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Incredible. <laughs> All right. Cam strikes again. Cam strikes again. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what Steve has to say. Uh, so, 
It's a complicated question. <laughs> <laughs> is it? Does it have to be It is. <laughs> it does have to be um, I really like sea cucumbers. It's very complicated. Why is everyone laughing at me? <laughs> it was unexpected. Unexpected, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, so sea cucumbers are, are still kind of enigmatic to me. Um, but I also really like and I want to amplify all the undescribed species that we don't know about yet. Ooh. They are my favorite. Excellent. The they may not know it yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but they may not know it yet. Mm. <laughs> I'm surprised to hear a sea cucumber from you. Yep. Yeah, can you say what, what's enigmatic about them? Because uh, some of them are see-through. <laughs> <laughs> like, we know when they have to be. <laughs> Literally transparent. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it, it's it's always been um, so. If you consider the carbon content of the deep sea floor sediments, right? It's extremely nutrient poor. Yet these animals can persist for for some time. We don't know anything about their age. We know that they grow large. We know that they, you know, can support a, a mass, gelatinous mass. We know that uh, they eat pretty much nonstop. Um, to the essentially, um, so how how do they metabolically support that that uh, that aspect of their biology? How do they gain enough nutrition from the, some of the most nutrient poor uh, sediments and and organic material on Earth? And it's always been a fascinating question to me. Cool. Yeah, I'll take it. All right, Bronwyn, what's your favorite animal, your sea animal? Um, I guess my favorite sea animal would be the Hawaiian spinner dolphin because they are, they're so uh, playful and they jump and they spin out of the water and do these corkscrew spins. They can get a lot of rotations in and th their bellies turn pink when they're doing it. So what's this creature's name? Like little magical, Spinner sea dolphins. creatures. Yep. Yeah. Spinner dolphins. Awesome. They are beautiful. Yeah. They're really social too, right? Very social. Yeah. Travel in very large pods. Okay, Samantha, what's your favorite sea animal? Yeah, I'm like staring into the abyss trying to <laughs> see that answer. Um, which probably means I should just go with one of my favorite pelagic invertebrates, which is the siphonophore. I'll take any siphonophore, really. Um, they're just also very enigmatic to me, uh, even though they're transparent. Um, colonial animals that uh, live in chains, different parts of the animal do different things, so there's a swimming part, there's a feeding part, there's a reproductive part, there's stinging parts. Um, we often get to see them while we're doing our blue water descents in a sense. Um, and yeah, blue water is actually one of my favorite parts of the dive. Nice. Yeah, I mean, I'm having a great time with blue water. Yeah. It was thrilling when we saw that uh, what did Steve? What did he think it was a few minutes ago? That it, that transparent. It it could have been a tinafore. I think it um, was tinafore. It could also have been a appendicularian or a larvation. It's a type of um, pelagic tunicate, basically. Cool. But I think uh, I was leaning towards tinafore, but it was just for a second, so yeah. it's hard to tell. I would plus one near tinafore. It looked like it had the kind of lobes. Lobes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's got those lobes. Mm -hmm. Oh, is also bioluminous, some of them, which is awesome. <laughs> Send out little clouds of goopy fireworks to distract the predator. <laughs> Gabby. Sounds very distracting. Yes. Um, I'm not bold enough to have a favorite invert, um, <laughs> but because uh, I think they're squishy and 
Um, no charismatic minor fauna? So I'm going charismatic charismatic <laughs> megafauna. Okay. My favorite sea creature is a mola mola. Oh, Because nice. they're just like ridiculously charming. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen one, Gabby? Yeah. They're I've so seen baby ones. The baby ones are ridiculous. They like haven't yeah. really like picked a side, and yeah. they're like little dorsal fin, like swapping around. <laughs> oh, it's so good. They're Do really they cool. ever look like they know how to swim, though? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's the wrong. No, that's it. <laughs> that's just, a nice one. I love them. So charming. They are charming. Yeah. When I was little, my brothers and I, we didn't know what they were called, and we would we called them half fish because they look like just so odd and they look like they're fish cut in half because they don't have a yeah, typical they don't have the an another side yeah so for the longest time we were just calling them half fish <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in monterey in the um in the fall there's uh, a lot of fall spring a season um there's a lot of baby mola and the sea lions like to uh, play with them like frisbees. So sometimes we do see oh. half, half fish. Oh, jeez. <laughs> but I'm That's glad you didn't brutal. see those as a child growing up. <laughs> like frisbees. Yeah, and you'll, you'll be diving along the coast and see like many of them on the seafloor, unfortunately. But. Yeah, they're such a peaceful creature. They yeah, they really are. And they eat jellies. Do they really? Mm-hmm. It's like yes. too. That's, that's why they... nice of them because jellyfish are my least favorite sea creature. <gasps> oh, well, there you go. Yeah, yeah that's, their little mouths don't have um, jaws, so they can just slurp. They can only slurp food in. Um. <laughs> oh, Gabby's going on mute. <laughs> 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 uh, and their their faces are... Um, uh, their skin is really thick around their mouths because uh, to protect from stings. Hmm. Well, there you go. Somebody is wondering, what does en enigmatic mean? Yeah, we keep saying that word. Um, so it's like mysterious, like unknown. And also we keep saying charismatic, um, so really likable. And we also keep saying sub-aerial. We do keep saying sub-aerial. <laughs> what does that one mean? That doesn't sound like a real word. <laughs> Where's, where's the smug cam? <laughs> I, know, the cam. <laughs> I learned a new one. Etheric. Am I saying that right? Etheric. Etheric. What's that mean? Etheric. Uh, uh, Nick. It means, <laughs> it means a very uh, fine-grained uh, crystalline mass where it's typically naked to the, uh, to the excuse me, uh, typically you can't see it with a naked eye, uh, not visible. Um, whereas opposed to... Uh, uh, larger crystals like a like a granite, you know, you could see you could visibly see uh, the slowly growing nucleated crystals. The upshot is it's very smooth and shiny. Is that a mctophid, lanternfish, drifting past? Oh, there it goes. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. I, yeah. It's one <laughs> one tiny fish. Somebody, I thought I heard somebody's name. What? Do you know many people named mctophid? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I get called that here and there. Yeah. <laughs> Is that the new Bobby Argus? <laughs> Mick uh, Topid. It's, it's the one that lives on Adeline. <laughs> we'll have to tell that story at some point in the blue water. Uh, what's Karen's favorite an sea animal? Um, I think I would go with the seahorse. Mm. Sounds like kind of a basic uh, choice. But I really like how prehistoric they look. They look, and I feel like their their mode of transportation, like the the locomotion, is just like really inefficient. But somehow they just <laughs> yeah, they're not bothered. How, how do they get around? I can't they've even imagine. Like, I think they've got a bit of a dorsal fin, and mm -hmm. it like kind of like shimmers sort of. And I think also their tail like wraps around like debris in the water, and they use that kind of as a sail. But it's just like <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I really like that. Amazing. I think yeah. mine, if I get like a, a surface water and a deep sea ocean uh, double up, my favorite is the mimic octopus. Ooh. Ooh. 
because they were just crazy. And <laughs> if they lived longer, I think octopus would like rule the world. Um, they're super smart. Um, and yeah, just like incredible the patterns that they can create. And then I think my favorite deep sea animal is the hagfish, just because they're weird and shouldn't be able to survive on what they do and can tie themselves in knots and they're just odd. So slimy. They're very yeah. goopy, yeah. They're very goopy. Yeah. Nice. But the knots are pretty bizarre. Yeah. yeah. What, what does the mimic octopus do that's like extra from octopus to warrant it's like mimic name? They're just particularly good at like basically mimicking rocks and reefs and there's amazing videos where they can like sit next to a piece of um, drifting seaweed and perfectly blend in and then they like move their legs just like they're drifting in the current too. Oh, cool. um, completely disappear and like scurry across the seafloor and then like go to a rock and disappear again. Um, yeah, they're just the way that they can change like their skin color and the like texture as well is just incredible. Oh, awesome. Nice. <coughs> oh. Must oh. be dinner time. Oh, oh wow. Oh. Okay. Ice cream day. Yeah. All right. It so is ice cream oh, day. Oh, it is ice cream day. Ice cream day. Ice cream Sunday. Ice cream day. <laughs> A few minutes ago, Steve looks at us and he says, only one more hour until ice cream. <laughs> That's the only way we know that time is passing is when we have ice cream on Sundays. All right. So um, our friends online, we are currently in blue water. That means that we are descending. So the ROVs. Hercules and Atalanta are making their way down to our uh, exploration site, the dive site. So we're going to be down to about 9,514 feet, or about 2,900 meters. We're expecting this dive to be about uh, 24 hours long. And we are exploring an unnamed seamount. Surprise, surprise. This is our third dive. <laughs> Our third dive of NA-153, exploring the region around Johnston Atoll. And it is ice cream day. So yeah, on Sundays we get ice cream. We're very spoiled on this ship. I wasn't expecting to eat so well, to be honest. The food is uh, quite nice. The food is great. I eat better on the ship than I do at home. Great Good evening. Check, check, mic check. We hear you loud Is that a joke clear. you make often? Huh? Is uh, that a joke you make often? <laughs> Mike, Mike, check. Yep. <laughs> Welcome to uh, the four to eight. Happy uh, to have you. Yeah, I heard they, uh, you know, they heard they were doing blue water, so they decided to bring me in <laughs> <laughs> to welcome everybody in back to another episode of KOET Blue Water Watch. KOET. <laughs> Not like <laughs> NAUT like or something. Oh, it's a radio station. I know. So it's got to be K, <laughs> and then you got to have that three letters over there. It's definitely going to have to be like K-Rock or something. <laughs> I mean, yeah. this, this oh, okay, okay. Well, some, uh, some people in here would, <laughs> would have a K-Rock station. Oh, yeah. The <laughs> geologist. Geologist. Okay. Uh, can we slow down the winch, please? Yes, going into manual. Um, can we radio TJ? Is he, let's see if he's down there. Does this work? Yep, this it's work? on. So if anybody's wondering, Hercules is currently 1,000 feet, or oh, it should be exact, 1,030 um, meters below. So again, we're aiming for 2,900 meters. So a little less yes. than halfway. Yes, yeah, I see TJ in the windshield, so I was hoping he had a radio. Um, Trevor, is that you? Yeah, I got it now. Okay, uh, yeah, we just switched the winch into manual mode. We're going very slow. I see that we have somebody named Will who has a birthday in exactly an hour. So thanks so much for spending your pre-birthday with us, uh, looking at some blue water here on the SPL. I hope that we see something really cool for your birthday. Um, just continue. continue slow here for a while. Let us know if you want us to speed it up. Yeah, 
Roger that, 10 to 15. Roger, 20. So real quick, circling back to that Tina for we saw, somebody wants to know what do they eat and how do they eat? I'm assuming it's plankton. Yeah, they have, uh, so there's a couple different feeding modes. Um, the the low bait Tina fours, which we think this one was, um, do feed by uh, creating uh, some feeding currents and ingesting food. Um, that way they have these, uh, ciliated comb rows that allow them to not only move but also to potentially um, influence water currents and flows around their body. Uh, there's also a group of tinnophores called the tentaculata who have tentacles and rather than being um, sticky, uh, rather than being stingy like a, like a, a jellyfish, they're sticky and so they use these sticky tentacles to collect food particles and ingest them. Cool. Coloblasts, I think they're called. I have to look that up. Col Coloblasts? Coloblasts, yeah. Coloblasts. I think. Could be making that up. <laughs> you would never. Yeah, no, that's right. Coloblasts. It's been a few years since Invertebrate Zoology 101, but <laughs> good to you know still I, still, got I it. still got it. Yep. So yeah, I guess people have picked up, we keep calling these dives or we keep saying at these dives that they're an unnamed this and they're an unnamed that. So again, tonight we're gonna be exploring an unnamed um, boundary seamount. And so somebody was wondering what does the naming, pro or how does the naming process work for unnamed places and how do they eventually officially become named? There is a process. Um, when we're here, on Nautilus and we're picking dive site names that we don't uh, normally officially name a site just by calling it so. Um, if a site has an official name according to uh, I believe uh, at least the, the reference we use is by Jebco um, I think uh, that uh, unless it has an official name we'll, we'll refer to it as uh, you know, something informal, um, you know, unnamed seamount and where it is relative to the area that we're working. Um, but if it does have a form formal name, we will use that. But since we're not going through the process of submitting the paperwork uh, and the documentation to formally name a seamount um, through uh, international organizations that, that do this kind of work, um, we're just trying to make sure we keep our sites named separately so we can distinguish one from another. Um, fortunately for this expedition, each dive, um, each uh, Hercules number that we use for our dives are also sites, so it makes it kind of easy and reduces our need to worry about um, differentiating site names since every different dive is a different seamount. Well, yeah. I vote we call it Bob. That was a great question. Since we are in a, a sanctuary, well, a, a monument, potentially a sanctuary, we want to be cognizant of applying formal names uh, when there's processes available to have this, um, this work done. I don't know if um, if anyone 
has ever done that affiliated or associated with Nautilus and the Ocean, Ex Ocean Exploration Trust, um, but it has been done uh, from other various organizations. Um, yeah, but there's, there, there's an extensive process that involves collecting multiple mapping data and, uh, and, and making sure you're using clean products and then submitting that along with documentation and justification for the name. Uh, but there is a, a fully formal process for doing that. It takes probably upwards of a year. Ooh, there's another jelly thing that oh. just went by. Let me see if I can highlight that one. I missed the Tina for earlier. Are you letting it just wash over you? Yeah, it's getting it almost perfect to that. <laughs> just letting it wash over me, yeah. So as I mentioned before, we're using two ROVs. For this dive, we have Hercules as well as Atalanta. Um, and there are no people that are inside of those ROVs. They are remotely operated vehicles, ROV. So Gabby up front as well as Karen, they are the ones who are... Uh, oh, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> oh, never mind, they're, they're having lunch. So we have Michael and we have James that are standing in. Um, so those pilots are the ones who are operating the ROVs from the ship and um, they're able to control those machines while they're thousands of meters below the surface. are boiling the ocean. It's going to be a very uh, long, long process. Yeah. Doesn't need a doesn't need our help to do that right now, given the state of things. We could what type of lasers are these? Are these a Menko? They're green. <laughs> very good. <laughs> I like the green ones. So. Uh, the internet is curious, how much longer before we reach the sea floor? Uh, 80 minutes. 79. You can 79. tell the internet, 80 seconds. minutes. All right, so an hour and... 20. 20. Roughly. Roughly. It's gonna be great. We're gonna get to know each other very well in this hour and 20 minutes. On this episode of... Uh, <laughs> Uh, you get to be the host of KOET, -E Blue K Water this Radio. That's what it is, KOET. -E yeah. I need to put on my host for okay. those music. smooth, deep ocean <laughs> sounds. Smooth, deep ocean oh, sounds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's really nothing. You really hear nothing. <laughs> <laughs> that's wind. I don't think you hear wind. <laughs> no way. Snoring. Is somebody sleeping down there? Bloop, 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 bloop. 
Are you, how are you able to live stream the video from the ROVs and the ship to us? That's an excellent question. So um, on the ship, we have a very complex internet system. Um, we use something called telepresence. So essentially there's this really big dome that we have on the back of our ship and that uh, is able to send information to a satellite and then that sends information to the inner space station in um, Rhode Island and then that gets sent out to the rest of the world. I wish there was a video I can show you all about exactly what I'm talking about but essentially that's how we're doing it. A question came in about rocks, and I'm going to give that to Nick. So the question is, uh, or I should say sediment question. Um, do, so does the content of the sediment vary much throughout the ocean? And is it affected much by the makeup of the underlying rock and age of sediment like continental soils are? That's a, okay. that's a big one. Yeah, that, that's kind of a loaded question there. Um, not a sedimentologist myself. I work at Igneous Rocks, but uh, from my knowledge, I can tell you that the sediment does vary uh, quite considerably in the ocean basins. Um, most notably, you'll see calcium carbonate uh, deposits up to about 4,500 meters, uh, where you'll reach the carbonate, con con carbonate con compensation depth. Excuse me. Uh, past that, you're going to um, see a lot of the calcium uh, dissolution and uh, kind of switch to siliceous ooze deposits which will eventually make chert beds. Uh, you also might find some uh, clay deposits uh, from uh, uh, fine dust uh, that's been blown off the coast of uh, desert areas like the Sahara Desert. Uh, so you might see some of those across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, we can't really date sediments directly. Uh, They'll only tell you the time, uh, dating a particular mineral will tell you the crystallization age, not uh, the age of deposition of the sediment itself. Uh, so that you have to use different techniques um, like uh, magnetic delineations uh, that record uh, pole reversals. Um, as far as how they differ from continental crusts, those continental crusts will uh, definitely appear to be much older uh, as the continental crust is uh, much older in general than any oceanic crust which can only uh, exist for around maybe 180 million years before it's uh, pulled down back into the mantle, subducted um, due to its density contrast with uh, the continental crust. So hope that answers the question sufficiently. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys do, do, shrimp, do, you guys do a shrimp count? You know, uh, we don't. I don't uh, but there's two for the shrimp count. I, I think I vote that we start doing a shrimp count. That's a uh, 12 to 4 invention. I know. Oh, okay. well, you guys can't do it then. <laughs> <laughs> We're at two, you said? Two. Marvel House. Yes, Thanks two, so much, though. Jane. That's uh, two tallies, not an 11, FYI. <laughs> yeah. what's, the, what's the reason behind the shrimp count? Boring in blue water sometimes. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. fair. Not boring, but we'll take what we can get in blue yeah, water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. go. It's good to see the professionals are generating data <laughs> from this. <laughs> As we're mapping shrimp populations. <laughs> can you imagine? Oh my gosh. Um, somebody's asking how, uh, they're asking, is there a delay in what we see in our homes? So the telepresence, uh, the way that that works, how, how, how long is the delay? And I actually don't know the answer to that question. Is, is that like, a Logan question? I don't know. Can we make up answers? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we'll get back to you on that one. That, that's something that I would like to know myself. I want to say 
I think I, I was told it was something like eight seconds. Eight seconds. So not bad. Not bad. Well, it was lovely working with you guys. See you later. <laughs> See you tomorrow. Toodaloo. Same time. <laughs> oh, hopefully not. We should be recovered by then. Yeah, that's right. 24 hours. Yeah. <laughs> time again. I know. The concept of time. time is <laughs> Tomorrow is the non ice cream day for. Yeah. <laughs> we base it all on ice cream. All right. So, yeah, people are wondering the white stuff we keep seeing. <gasps> oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. You didn't bring some up here with ice cream and I. That's our honeydew mochi flavor. You didn't bring any up for you? Dang. All right. Well, can't wait to try that. Anyway, um, back oh, to the white stuff we're saying. It's a minor distraction. Yeah, that was, that got me. Uh, so we're seeing marine snow, those little white specks that we're seeing all on the, in the water. Um, so that is organic matter that is slowly, slowly making its way down to, into the depths. Uh, so it can be anything from, you know, plankton, fish scales, just any sloughed off skin oh, or okay. whatever. Um, bacteria. Bacteria, yes, bacteria. So all of that uh, makes up this white stuff called marine snow. Very different than snow we have on land. You mean subaerial? Subaerial, yeah. Subaerial snow. Subaerial environments. Oh, gosh. It's going to get old fast, yeah. <laughs> Might as well get it over with. Yeah, just get it out. Just yeah. get it out of our system. <laughs> Subaerial snow. It's <laughs> gracious. Or is that aerial? Aerial. Ooh. It's only aerial for a moment before it hits. Yeah, once it hits the hits the ground, I believe it's subaerial snow. <laughs> I think I just might have ice cream for dinner. My mom's listening. She heard that. <laughs> I'll have dinner some, too, Mom. There might be some leftover waffles from breakfast. Oh. Ooh. Some waffles okay. and ice cream. Yeah. Why not? Sure. Live gotta a get, little. Got to get creative out here. <laughs> Some people are wondering about the uh, depth and temperature readings that Hercules provides while on this dive. I do think it used to be readily available on the right-hand side of the homepage, um, but if you click where it says more data towards the bottom of that strip on the right-hand side, it should take you to a window where you can be able to access that. So Hercules, <coughs> excuse me, is about 1,409 meters below the surface. And again, our target depth of, uh, we have our target depth of 2,900 meters. Somebody is wondering, what biology do we expect to see on this dive? And what are your bioscientists on board interested in seeing this dive? <clears throat> so 
So uh, the goals for this dive at this seamount, biologically, uh, are to characterize uh, the seafloor, primarily benthic community. Uh, at the seafloor, we expect to see uh, not only things that are attached to the seafloor, like corals and sponges, and the biodiversity they support, like invertebrates, but also uh, demersal animals like fishes that may interact or live close to the bottom. Um, so first and foremost, getting imagery and surveying the, um, the landscape, seascape uh, of the seafloor uh, on the seamount and along our dive track. And if we do have the opportunity to uh, collect materials uh, we're generally aiming for species that are poorly known from the area, um, um, those that may be you know, really representative of this site, uh, that may differentiate it from another site nearby or, or in the vicinity, uh, new, new potential new species um, that might be informed by our uh, team of taxonomic specialists on ship as well as on shore. Um, and we're also planning on collecting some um, biological materials, biological samples that may be associated with push cores. Um, so any push cores we take will be uh, sectioned for uh, looking at inver uh, invertebrate in fauna uh, in the sediments like worms and small crustaceans possibly. Um, what else? Uh, that's about it. Um, we have some uh, water samples we'll be taking for various different chemical and, and uh, biological um, tests, uh, looking at carbonate chemistry, but also environmental DNA in the water, which we'll be taking along the dive track concurrent with uh, high density or high diversity biological communities. Uh, all of the above. Thank you so much, I think I'm missing a page. Hmm. How many pages do you have? Yeah, I think there's one more page that should be appended here. Because we're, we're also missing the watch, uh, the watch bill. Here, uh, it's not a big deal. If we really need it, we can pull it up here yeah just in case you're not sure who's on watch
So this isn't technically my watch. I'm filling in for Bronwyn, but I have a question about the dive plan, which is, it looks like our first waypoint is dog-legged to our second and third way waypoint. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason behind that? Um, yeah, so we're, we're aiming, you know, it, we, we don't want to just go up the side of a seamount and kind of have this uniform uh, transect. Um, there are reasons why you might want to do that, but we also want to look at potential other um, geomorphological features on a seamount. So we're going to look at the slope in addition to the ridge. So we get a little bit of diversity, which may have different biology and it may have slightly different geological characteristics too. Mm. Got it. Thanks. Hello, everyone. This is Ashley Lucky covering for Brittany. Steve, can you tell us a little bit about why the diversity, the biodiversity, would be different in that area? Um, different uh, substrate. Um, shapes can create different types of current flows um, as water flows around it. So uh, we are basically, you know, Seamount is essentially an island, submarine island in the currents of the deep sea. There are larger currents that move around a seamount which create structures like eddies or, uh, um, you know, micro, micro um, habitats within a seamount landscape. So having a diversity of those um, types of habitats, substrates, characteristics can influence where you find biology and which species. Did you all already give an estimate for how long it will take to get to the seafloor? Uh, we're looking at, at the current speed, about 50 minutes. Do we have two shrimp on the shrimp count? Two shrimp already. Looks like there's two on the board. There you go. We have a question in the chat for our favorite ocean-themed song, and B-52's Rock Lobster cannot be listed. <laughs> what is this hate? What is this hate going on? <laughs> well, they, they used it as, as an example, but I'm going to say we've used that as Must an example nice. a couple times. Oh, yeah, a lot of people are very excited. There's some ice cream. <laughs> Sunday ice cream day. This is the first dinner we've had on these watches, so we're working it all out. We've got Samantha back. Does anybody want to chime in with their favorite ocean-themed song? I feel like, I feel like uh, Yellow Submarine's a pretty easy one. Oh, that's a nice one. Yeah. I wouldn't have thought of that. 
reminiscent of Herc, kind of. <laughs> We're getting a lot of ice cream feedback in the chat. Lots of people are very excited that it's Sunday ice cream day. <laughs> Looks like we're excited about it too. Samantha, just confirming Hello. that depth at bottom we think is estimated closer to 3,000, right? Like 29, 58 is what's on the dive plan. But then I know in the HERT calculator we have 2778. I don't know if that was just from last time still. I think that might just be the last one. Uh, 2958. <laughs> Mariana's <laughs> trench. <laughs> 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 Perfect. Okay, cool. Thanks. Just trying to time when we're going to turn on the cameras. Yeah. Oh, um, yes. We decided not to turn the cameras on for launch. Was yes. That, was that intentional? Yes. Uh, okay. We will turn them on like 300 meters off bottom or something ish like that. Okay. I don't know. We're. Just we it needs a little things need a little time to start up before we're on bottom, but um, okay. we okay. wanna yeah try and extend whatever that burnout time seems to be. Okay. Um, okay, great. So, Gabby, I guess that'll still be your watch. Like 2,700 meters probably will be good. Okay, sounds great. Sea King, yeah? Or Sea? Uh, sea Net Pro. Mm -hmm. And it is the Sea King, yeah. And yes. Yes, we do. Navigator, do you have a favorite? Ocean theme song. <laughs> Hello, science communication fellow. Hi. Uh, <laughs> uh, an ocean themed song. Uh, I, I got one stuck in my head now. No, 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 we don't need that. <laughs> I guess I'm gonna need a minute for that. You're good. No pressure. I mean, I've gone through my, uh, I, I've gone through a shanty phase, a sea shanty phase, as nice. many have. Which was but a phase. Yeah. I think we might need a playlist. All ocean nautical themes. That's true. We don't have anything like that on the website. We have reading lists recommended by Nautilus folks on the website, but we don't have do any music. Do we really? Like, yeah, we do. Oh, I have some stuff to contribute. Great. You want to add I some? Went in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll take any recommendations. Um, okay. <laughs> 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 like really? Like no, we we're doing songs now. I've got to focus. Okay. You Stick to songs book. then books. <laughs> um, I the only thing I can think of right now is like all of the Stan Rogers classics. Mm. Um, like uh Barrett's Privateers or Wreck of the Athens Queen or something. Those are I was thinking about Barrett's Privateers. Those are the too, only yeah. ones that, like, that's what's popping into my head right now. I know there is going to be others, but, like, Stan is, Stan's popping into my head right now. But that's not a book. Okay, book. <laughs> um, right now I'm only thinking of, like, uh, sort of nonfiction, but um, In the Heart of the Sea, classic, Voyage mm. of the Essex, inspiration yeah. for Moby Dick, so good. 
Godforsaken Sea, uh, the story of the uh, solo circumnavigation of Antarctica in sailboats, the race that happens every few years, the Vendée Globe. It was amazing. Um, Wait, really, Debbie, what was the book on this called? This is called Godforsaken Sea. Godforsaken Sea, cool. And what I like about it is it talks a lot about sort of like the ethics of um, of exploration and like what people are prepared to risk and ask us other people to risk in order to do things like solo circumnavigate Antarctica. Interesting. Um, I thought that was pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, that, that is interesting. It definitely comes up a lot now. Because what you're willing to risk is one thing, but what you're willing to ask, to ask to other risk. people to yeah. risk. Yeah. Right, because like people will come to your rescue if True. you get in trouble down right. there. Um, and you do get in trouble down there. So anyways, I thought that was really amazing. Um, and just like incredible like feats of bravery and endurance by those sailors. That's really cool. And Blind Man's Bluff is like the story of how the Cold War gave us the technology that we're using right now. Um, Interesting. And that's wow. super cool. All the crazy antics that we went through to get this technology and use it to help fight the Cold War. Um, super awesome. Yeah, that was a lot. Okay. No, no I liked it. Right Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Put them on my list. I know, I'm adding to my list too. Yeah, those are all like, I'm not a nonfiction reader, but those are like compulsively readable nonfiction. If you're, if you're into this stuff yeah speaking of into this stuff i'm one of my favorite reads recently um has been talking a lot about the oxygen that comes from the ocean and we have a question here is it true that most of our oxygen comes from the ocean and not trees and how is that possible um yeah people like to give out the stat that like uh, when you take a like like half of the air you breathe comes from the ocean it's all kind of a bit more complicated than that, but uh, yeah, the, the phytoplankton, so the same way that you think about trees on land are taking in carbon dioxide and then they're releasing oxygen, there are tiny little plants in the, organi in the ocean called phytoplankton, that phyto for plant, like plant-like plankton, that um, they, they also photosynthesize, so they also take up carbon dioxide and release oxygen. And um, and these tiny creatures uh, periodically, and in different parts of the ocean, bloom. And they can form these huge blooms that you see. I mean, they're continuously there, but also these huge blooms seasonally that you can see from space in satellites. Um, and when they are taking advantage of all the nutrients in the water uh, in order to make ultimately make food that will rain down or or rain down to the deep sea where we're seeing things eating that food now or be eaten by other animals uh, in the surface ocean they are when doing that also um releasing oxygen so yeah they definitely are significant contributors to oxygen on earth thank you that was great Speaking of that, I think we talk a lot about the marine snow, but earlier I saw you in the chat, it's also called ocean dandruff. Ocean dandruff. <laughs> I don't know that oh, I've ever like called it that. <laughs> but it works, but. <laughs> sure. I call it flocculent, too. Mm, flocculent. We're back to flocculent. <laughs> I haven't heard that one yet. <laughs> we hit that one on our first watch. Oh, yeah. oh nice. <laughs> <laughs> we only know so many big words, people. <laughs> Just trying to sound impressive. <laughs> All right, we have a question about how long this dive is lasting. It's going to be about 24 hours, and our max depth is 2,900 meters. The objective of the ROV dive is to explore an isolated seamount at the southwestern limit of the Johnston Atoll exclusive economic zone. And this place, ha this area has been previously mapped last year by the EV Nautilus, mm -hmm. but never been visually explored. So we're excited to see what we find. Currently, two shrimp on the shrimp count. <laughs> Starting somewhere. And I think we've got our viewers interested too. Why is the shrimp count being conducted? <laughs> 
Um, I think to pass the time, right? <laughs> <laughs> and what's the research goal? <laughs> I wish that, you know what, it's, it's being noted. Maybe it'll be valuable to someone eventually. I think we just like to see the shrimp as, as we pass through blue water, especially. Yeah. But um, some of our footage does then get annotated after the fact. So all the organisms, I mean, prioritizing the coral and sponge communities, but um, the organisms that we see in our video are then identified more specifically after the fact, more accurately after the fact, or to greater specificity. The shrimp are hard though, that's why it's good to zoom on them. I mean, some of them swim in very distinctive ways, like those dendrobranchia, the branchiata, the, um, the Aristeid shrimp that we see that have like the paddle-like uh, legs that they swim with. Yeah, those were those, those were really cool. beautiful last night too. It was almost like they folded over on themselves a little bit. Yeah. And then there's the nematocarcinid shrimp that have the super long antennae, and their legs too are are super long and thin. We see a lot of those. And then we have a question in the chat about the glare on Hercules camera. Is that from the down light? So I think we're just asking maybe about the bright light down at the bottom. Yep, there you go. Uh, very astute. It's not from the mids. It is yeah. from the downs. There you go. Yeah, that's how we got rid of them last time. time. This vehicle than I have. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We spend a lot of time on the vehicle. <laughs> That's a very targeted question. <laughs> <laughs> Who's out there? <laughs> I'm trying to think who that must be. <laughs> Identify yourself. <laughs> pretty late on the East Coast. Could be someone on the West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> Identify yourself. <laughs> Pilot, shape up. <laughs> Figure it out. Gabby, there's a question about blue water bear cubs. I'm not sure if you know. I'm sorry? Blue water bear cubs? Uh, I don't know. I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we, oh. Don't, we don't. No, I lied. Never mind. Is this what I think it is? I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can only think of one thing. That's I can too, which one is definitely thing. not. <laughs> Is it a Dan quote? Yeah. yeah. Is that a rewind? <laughs> no, it's a it's a bleep. It's a bleep. <laughs> it's a bleep. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, oh, no, it's, no it's there must be some other reference. That we're missing. Be another reference They're that talking about getting. tardigrades. Uh, that's what I was okay, that's what I was that's where oh, my okay. mind went, okay. but I couldn't remember the name. <laughs> <laughs> We passed through the oxygen minimum zone a little while ago, <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> which actually is related to the question that the previous viewer asked about um, about all the oxygen produced by those phytoplankton. So when those phytoplankton rain down and we're seeing all this marine snow from the phytoplankton, from the you know bits of dead organisms or fecal matter of, of things that live in the surface ocean, that rains down and on its path down, other things are also eating it. And so when they, that gets eaten, similar to how we uh, eat food and then in order to make energy for ourselves, we take up oxygen and we're releasing carbon dioxide. Everything that's eating all the marine snow on its way down in the water column does the same thing. And that takes up a lot of oxygen. A lot of things are consuming a lot of oxygen to eat the marine snow. And so um, since the water isn't being, uh, that area isn't being replenished with oxygen that, or with uh, water that's high in oxygen, you get these oxygen minimum zones. And those are exacerbated um, in warmer waters. So that's a problem that we're encountering more and more because warm waters hold less oxygen than cold waters do. 
but we saw our oxygen minimum zone this time at around 515 meters. And uh, I think the last dive we saw it closer to 300 something. So it's different in different areas of the ocean and at different times. Okay, All right, oh. handing back over to Steve. Bye, folks. Steve is back, Brittany's back. All full of ice cream. That ice cream is the best I've had in years. Yo, that I ice cream is so good. I don't understand. Honeydew mochi, like who thinks of that? <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> Scrumptious. Did I enjoy my honeydew mochi ice cream? I sure did. A little too much. I'm gonna be dreaming about it for the next week. So I don't know if this question was already answered, um, but there is a question about the glare on Herc's camera from the <laughs> down lights. So we are seeing a bunch of blue water right now, and it is lit up by uh, one of the ROVs, Hercules. And I'm assuming it might be the down lights. Do we have different types of lights on the ROV? Does anybody know the answer to that question? Yeah, we uh, we talked about this earlier. It okay. is it is the downlights. It's the someone, downlights. Someone being incredibly astute. Astute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's right. my one vocab word for the ships. Okay. There you go. Got it. Astute. <laughs> it's better than. Oh my gosh, I'm forgetting it already. Flocky my brain. Light. No, the 
the one, the one that Nick always says. Oh, uh, no, sub aerial. Sub nothing's, there you go. nothing's better than that. <laughs> <laughs> I think my brain is finally like, no, we're we're forgetting that now. Thanks. Okay, so I need, I'm scrolling in the chat for, I'm um, catching up because I was at dinner and somebody said something about Orinoco Flow by Enya and I need to know who that was because that's my favorite song. <laughs> who sent that? I heard somebody say it in this room, but maybe I'm hearing voices. Anyway, that's my absolute favorite song ever. So whoever said that, nice work. Yeah, Ashley filled me in on that. I don't know what that was about. So like I said, I'm just catching up on the chat right now. Um, yeah, so somebody wants to know the length of, this is their words, the umbilical between Atlanta and Hercules. So the, I don't know what the, what the length is between those two ROVs. Does anyone know? 30 meters. Yep. 30 meters. Yeah, uh, the tether is 100 feet long, 30 meters. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so again, we do use two ROVs when we are making these dives. We have Hercules and Atalanta. Hercules is beneath Atalanta by 30 meters. And Atalanta kind of trails above and uh, maybe a bit slightly behind. Um, and it's just a way for us to get a better view of where Hercules is and what is around Hercules. Got any other uh, crazy SCF questions for us, Brittany? Crazy SCF <laughs> questions. <laughs> They're coming. Um, this one's not crazy. It is a great question, though, and I'd love to get everyone else's input on this. So we have somebody viewing who is a geology student about to start their last year of undergrad. Um, they want to get their master's, PhD, super interested in ocean exploration and they're wondering um, what experience do we need to have in order to become a part of a deep sea exploration program. So I'll go ahead and start. Um, I am a science communication fellow. So I'm on the ship for just about a month. I'm visiting from the California Science Center in Los Angeles and at the Science Center I'm a senior educator. So. Um, I'm an informal educator. We get people that visit the museum and we have fun exploring science, doing different hands-on activities. And um, yeah, I, I have a really, really, really fun time doing it. I do happen to have a degree in aquatic biology. I have my bachelor's degree. Um, yeah, so I, I would, personally, I would say as long as you have the passion for it and you like truly are just genuinely interested in exploring. Um, 
I would say that you can go really, really, really far with that. Uh, so kind of to put myself on blast a little bit, in undergrad, I took a deep sea biology course and I did not pass that, but yet I am here on the ship. And so I just want to emphasize that you don't have to be a perfect student. You don't have to get the perfect degree and do everything perfectly and get everything right. Um, it's fine to mess up and to not pass a class and you can still go really, really far. So that's my two cents. If anybody else wants to chime in, feel free to do so. I would say try to make some connections with people involved in deep sea projects. Um, Your mic is kind of low, so I don't know oh, if they can hear you. Yeah, go for it. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I was saying uh, I, I think it's important to uh, find professors and maybe advisors who are uh, involved in these type of deep sea projects. They're probably uh, a great lifeline. Um, if you, you know, reach out to one, if, if there's none at your institution, um, it would probably be, probably be a good path to take. How about you, Steve? Um, Any advice? Yeah. Uh, so my path to get here was, you know, kind of motivated by you know, just interests I had through undergrad as well. Um, I had a fortunate run-in um, with some staff members that uh, OET at the time that allowed that encouraged me to apply for the Ocean Sciences Internship Program, and that allowed me to come out to sea for for yeah for the f first time. Um, and get to work on Nautilus way back in 2013. Wow. And you've done quite a few dives, from what I understand. <laughs> Nautilus dive or? Not, uh, well, in or general, I guess. Hercules dives. Yeah, uh, I don't know how many dives. Um, probably not that many in the big picture. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. I haven't counted up how many cruises lately. I think it's somewhere in the 30, 32. 32 cruises? That's a lot of dives within those cruises, I'm sure. So, yeah. nice. Some of them were um, transit and mapping uh, cruises in the early days. But uh, yeah, mostly ROV cruises. Logan, you just graduated with your master's from UC Santa Barbara. Do you want to talk about um, your experience and how you, do you believe that you ended up here on the Nautilus? Yeah, uh, sure. I was. Uh... There I am. Hi. Yeah. Um... Sure. I, it was kind of an end around route for me, um, but I originally, I think Nick's advice is great. Um, I think like one, talking to PhD students about what they do and asking them about what they do is always a great idea. Um, in order to be a PhD student, you have to be pretty into what you're doing. And I think generally they're pretty interested in sharing what they're passionate about. And if you can kind of like share your shared passion with them about the deep ocean, then um, I'm sure there's a lot to learn and a lot of like connections to be had. But I ended up on Nautilus um, after watching for a couple years in undergrad. And then um, I was talking to my, funny enough, um, my film advisor, actually. I was a marine and conservation biology major, but I was a film minor. And my film advisor kind of had an eye out for me, and he uh, found this internship and kind of pointed it out to me and encouraged me to apply. Um, and that was back in 2019, 2020. Um, and it just took me a couple years to end up getting aboard. But yeah, I think if you have a passion for the deep sea and, and communication and um, I'm pretty sure that if you work to kind of create a path here you could absolutely end up joining Nautilus in the future.
beautifully said. Thanks, Logan. So just to recap, if anybody is just now joining us online, we are currently heading down on our third dive of NA-153, exploring Johnston Atoll. So we're aiming to get to 9,514 feet below, or about 2,900 <laughs> 2, 9, meters. I think I had too much ice cream at dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Got the jitters. Um, yeah, and so we're expecting the dive time to be about 24 hours. So the current depth of Hercules is 2,544, 545 now. So we're almost there to our, um, <coughs> to our dive site. So again, this is the four to eight crew. My name is Brittany. I'm a science communication fellow here on the Nautilus. Uh, if you have any questions or comments that you would like to send on over, please feel free to do, do so. There's a little chat box underneath the video screen on our homepage. Yeah, so uh, it's gonna be science. Um, the Ethernet bottle, and then both Triclops and DSC, which is digital still cam. Yeah. All right, I'm going to throw a curve ball in here, spice things um, up. Is uh, Leela in the van? I want to ask the control man, um, what is the last book you read? So I'll start. <laughs> I'm trying to remember the last book I read. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you haven't read any books on board yet? I dabble. I feel like I'm, I'm really bad at like committing to one book. I kind of read bits and pieces okay. of multiple books at the same time. Okay. Uh, Keep a little variety a little in your variety, life. You know? Um, one that I have on board with me that I really, really love, and it's like a very beautiful book to be reading on this ship, for me personally, is um, it's called How Far You Have Come by Morgan Harper Nichols. And it's like beautiful illust illustrations and, po and poetry and like uh, just a story about her journey of traveling with her family and growing up and coming of age. I don't know. I just, I think it's a very unique book and I really love it. Um, the way that it's put together and yeah. That like is a beautiful book. Right. Her art's really neat. Samantha. Yeah. <laughs> you and I are just <laughs> 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 two pieces of a pot. Yeah. Um, no, it's a gorgeous book and I, like every page of it almost makes me like just want to cry, but in a good way. Anyway, so that's one. Um, do I popcorn it, or do we just keep going down the line like we've been doing? Uh, I can go I next. Can so uh, I actually just finished uh, my book that I brought, and that is Dune Messiah by Frank Herbert. That is the second Dune book out of uh, at least six, I think maybe nine books to in total. Um, it's very good. I like how uh, Frank Herbert describes and tries to explain what it might, uh, what prescience or like kind of an omnip omnipotence uh, might sound might uh, it's very quiet. sound and feel like um, it's a really good book for Dude. somebody who likes uh, sci-fi and All right. genres. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Sure. Okay. So let's go ahead and table that book chat yeah. for a second. I am seeing some questions okay. coming in, so. Okay. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay. So 
So why did we switch from Argus to Atalanta? So Argus is okay. um, just kind of on a hiatus right now. Argus is on land. There are still plans to use Argus, but just for the purposes of these dives, we're using Atalanta. Atalanta is just a bit smaller, um, kind of easier to maneuver. Where did the name Atalanta come from? That's a great question. If I remember correctly, it's one of the hounds of a god? I need to look that up. But yeah, a very, very unique name. So we have Hercules, we have Argus, we have Atalanta. Atalanta yep. was the uh, only female Argonaut among Jason and the Argonauts who went in search of the Golden Fleece. Thank you, Samantha. Yeah. So definitely not a dog. Steve, would you like to talk about the last book that you've read? Or maybe your favorite book? Um, what have I read lately? Uh, I'm in the middle of a book. Uh, I don't remember the title. Uh, but it's about, um, not so surprisingly, uh, specimens that have been discovered long after they've been collected as new species, but they've lied dormant in museum collections for decades and decades and sometimes centuries. And um, there was a, a book that, you know, did a number of case studies, number of chapters about how, um, how scientists eventually ended up finding these lost species and describing them and finding new biodiversity where it was, you know, not suspected. What's that book called? Um, what's what's the book called? Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to remember. I think it's a textbook. Oh. <laughs> Wait. No. Oh, <laughs> no, it's not. Smoke, no. smoke science camp. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a textbook. Let's <laughs> flip on the SCC. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, it is called. It's called The Lost Species. Hmm. Great Expeditions and Collections of Natural History. Interesting. Mm -hmm. It's a really good book. Published by who? Uh, <laughs> is it a quiz? No, no, I'm just curious. Like, is it what a year? university who's... No, it's a, no. It's a popular press. Okay. It's yeah. uh, McCraw Hill. <laughs> who's asking? <laughs> or uh, piercing, possibly. <laughs> I think we might need to flip on the SCC. <laughs> Uh, but the same author does some really <laughs> cool books. Um, he wrote another book. I'll try and find his name in a second. He, he wrote another book about um, ambergris. Okay. Wow. You got my attention? Yeah, yeah. same. Uh, called Floating Gold. Yeah. Interesting. And how people search for ambergris. And <coughs> Interesting. Yeah. Christopher Kemp. I, I read the book of uh, Floating Gold many, many years ago, but I, I just found this most recent one. <laughs> I have to be more specific in my Google search. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So here's a really interesting question in the chat. Um, there is no sunlight for photosynthesis in the deep ocean, which is true. So where does 
I guess, where do the animals get the oxygen that they need? Oh, from? that's such a great question. I've been waiting for someone to ask oh. that for such a long All time. Right. Um, <laughs> Science cam. Yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, oxygen is one of the most important uh, things for heterotrophic life, things that, you know, um, pretty close get their energy from other organisms uh, that is not the Sun um, and so with few exceptions uh, like chemosynthetic ecosystems okay. uh, where you might have microbial you know uh, energy sources oxygen has to come from the surface at, at some point there's no uh, geological origin for you know, the quantities of oxygen that we find uh, on the seafloor so you might be familiar with something called the, the, the ocean conveyor belt uh, or thermohaline circulation. And that's how oxygen gets to the deep sea. And basically uh, in the winter in the northern, it starts generally in the winter in the northern uh, hemisphere of the North Atlantic. Um, cold, dense water downwells um, and carries with it relatively well oxygenated waters to the deep sea. And that water follows a cycle all the way around the ocean basin through the Southern Ocean uh, and essentially oxygenates the deep waters. Um, the surface oceans that are well mixed are oxygenated from the surface, but the, the deep waters are, are oxygenated by a thermohaline circulation. And in those areas where, <coughs> where uh, you have upwelling, you'll more than likely have an explosion of life, right? Mm. So it, it's an interesting story. Um, in upwelling zones, oftentimes they're, well, at least the, okay. the upwelling zones that are, um, oh, no, one second. Stand by for Steve. He's doing science stuff back here. But yeah, that was an excellent question. Um, yeah, somebody's wondering about the, why, why does the water look cloudy? Um, yeah, that's not a silly question at all. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're just seeing a bunch of blue water right now, but we do occasionally see these little white specks uh, that are within the water. I don't know if that's what you're talking about with the, for the cloudiness, or it could just be, you know, from the flashlights that the ROV is using, and it just appears cloudy um, because of the diffuse light. But uh, if you are talking about the white specks, that's something that's called marine snow, and essentially it's just little bits and pieces of debris um, organic debris, so it can be uh, bacteria, plankton, little bits of animals that have been digested and, you know, turned into fecal matter. It could be, oh, there's a little squiggly thing. I don't know what that is. There it goes. Um, yeah, so marine snow is made oh. up of, oh, yeah, what is shrimp. that? Oh, shrimp. Is that number three? Shrimp count three. That was a good shrimp. 